Hello, Steve Snodgrass here, president of the Omaha UFO Study Group. Since 2010, I have offered an annual talk on the topic of ufology and the extraterrestrial hypothesis to be presented at our annual UNO UFO Symposium at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. This is talk number six, entitled The Spirit of Ufology where I have decided to start with a fresh approach that begins with the following scenario. Let's say you just had an extraordinary UFO ET close encounter of the third kind with a non-human intelligence and a physical craft. Now your encounter fit the profile of many such experiences that befuddle researchers. The encounter absolutely blew your mind. There was an obvious manifestation of something physical, and it was as objectively real to you as any ordinary experience, to the point it was undeniable. But unlike any ordinary experience, this was a burst of something wholly incredible and unexplainable. It was not possibly real. Just like many reports, your experience was intense and intensely disturbing in that you experienced a loss of will, a loss of self-control, and perhaps panic as the experience unfolded. But at the same time, the experience was magnificent, full of meaning, and there was this expansive sense of euphoria. You were a helpless subject watching and interacting as the experience played out, but there was also this sense of profundity, an opening and widening vision of reality that relayed to you a message of great importance. So here's my question. Yes, what would you make of it? Well, you'd be skeptical, right? Was it that chicken that tasted a little funny last night? Was it all those energy drinks? Did I eat the worm at that club? don't remember. Was I binge watching Netflix again? You know, you'd go down a list of possibilities, trying to make sense of it, finding again and again at every turn that you can't deny what happened. It was real. You know what you saw. But, you know, you got to work tomorrow, so you don't have time for this. You'd probably look for explanations. But finding none of them reasonable, you wind up with what seems to be only two options. In subtle ways, with some time to process everything, you'd begin to either alter your experience to fit your worldview, or option two, you'd begin to alter your worldview to fit your experience. Here's a way to look at it. You would either start to become a true believer, but in this sense, a true believer is one who knows what happened could not have happened. So you would seek ways to deny that it happened because you've already decided it couldn't. It didn't happen to you, and so your reasoning goes. Therefore, it could not happen to anyone else, and has not happened to anyone else. On the other hand, you could go down the road of being an enthusiast. With total acceptance of what happened to you, you will logically conclude it must have happened to someone else. You will establish an uncritical eye that eventually concludes that surely it has happened to everyone else at some point or another. Bud Hopkins developed his four classic attitudes around these two ideas, the true believer and the enthusiast. True believers know that all, re know that all, reports, and, uh, all reports are hoaxes or perceptual psychological aberrations whereas the enthusiast is convinced all reports are true and meaningful and hit at some part of the puzzle. The true believer has a rigid belief system, whereas the enthusiast is uncritical, except, of course, for the idea of the cabal, you know, some kind of grand conspiracy or elite, powerful folks who are covering up the truth. In other words, the true believer says it's impossible because they know that in advance. They have a passionate disbelief. They come across as inflexible ideologues, and we know them today as the ever-present debunkers. Whereas enthusiasts cause just as much mayhem. They believe anything is possible. They have passionate beliefs about such experiences. 
We know them today as cultists, or perhaps hoaxers themselves, trying to wake up civilization. And they're the ever-present conspiracy theorists. Now, my position on this is that both of these attitudes cause mayhem in the field of ufology. And in the words of psychologist Abraham Maslow, this begins to look like sickness. The third attitude Hopkins uses he calls simply the skeptic, and he advocates for all of us to become skeptics. Well, so do I, and that's the point of this presentation. But before I go there, I need to mention the fourth classic attitude, that of the incurious. These folks are far too busy with their ordinary lives. They don't care about the UFO ET phenomenon. And so any discussion of it truly makes no difference to them. Hopkins summarizes the incurious like this. First, keep in mind they represent the largest segment of the population. They really are totally indifferent. They might occasionally slip into slight intrigue or mild condescension when watching the, alien anci the Ancient Alien series, for example, but only as a temporary distraction in their spare time. The incurious are characterized by what Hopkins calls their, quote, ongoing and collective lack of interest, end quote. Folks like you who are listening to this might call them muggles or people who are caught in the matrix, unable to open their eyes. I prefer to say that they are just too busy, but that isn't fair either, I suppose. They just really don't care, and we need to remember that. Now, what I'd like to say is that once a profound and profoundly disturbing and bewildering experience like this occurs... Such experiences demand curiosity. To a greater or lesser extent, between taking your kids to soccer games, going to work, watching the Huskers play football and volleyball, you would be asking yourself, wouldn't you, what happened to me? What was that? What are they? Where did they come from? Am I crazy? Who am I really? And what does this all mean? What I'd also like to say is the greatest risk to the precious nature of the experience you had is that you will begin to make appeals to authority to find answers. You will look to experts you've never met who you think can help you explain what happened. The risk is that I've already told you who you will encounter when you do this. The true believers who will try to talk you out of it and the enthusiasts who will try to talk you into it. And most people, well, remember, most people I've already said are incurious, totally indifferent to your experience. Now, the last thing I want for you to consider is that I'm your authority. I am not your authority, so I'd like to be very clear here. I don't know what happened to you, and I can't answer any of your questions. What I'd like to simply point out is a third option. Now, for lack of a better term, I'll start by calling it something I proposed to the Mutual UFO Network back in the 1990s in an article for the MUFON Journal that was never published, by the way, uh, where I called these, this type, this attitude, the open-minded skeptic. Now, as you can see, the wheels are turning in this model. These are my wheels turning, netty, netty, not this, not that. Well, it sounds true, but not quite. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is not other than emptiness. Reality, how does that all work? Physics, biology, what's the relationship to that with neuroscience and consciousness? These are all my wheels turning. They don't have to be yours. I'd like to call this approach the bold and the beautiful. Bold in that it takes total courage and careful attention in the search for truth while preserving the beautiful and precious nature of your experience that is yours and yours alone. In my presentation two years ago, entitled The Truth About Ufology, I offered this slide, which I think applies here. I have found that science and mysticism both have wonder and skepticism at the helm. 
wonder, and skepticism are the guides for exploration in both methods. These are some of the things science and mysticism have in common listed here. They have the same strategy, they have the same goal, and they have the same problem. For more information, just put the words truth about ufology into a YouTube search if you'd like to know more about that. This third option takes at face value that strangeness of an experience and the likelihood of alternative explanations have an inverse relationship. From fuzzy nocturnal lights that could be just about anything to daylight disks, which are a bit more puzzling, especially if they have a radar echo, all the way to close encounters of the first, second, and third kind. The stranger things get, the fewer believable alternative explanations. Now, I've decided I'll mention two theories along the way, only because I think they're important for my purposes here. The first is what could be called Jacques Vallée's cultural thermostat theory. The idea here is to see the UFO as an object that appeared in order to break the force of any idea that could purport to explain it. The UFO is a confounding that entered history, it would seem, specifically to unseat or wreck materialistic, atomistic science of today as the dominant mythos of control in society. The UFO ET experience is absolutely confounding and challenges and begs for a bigger theory of physics, consciousness, and culture to explain it. The second is similar. Terence McKenna offers a conclusion that if nothing else, the UFO acts as, quote, an autonomous psychic entity slipped from the control of the ego and is approaching, laden with the otherness of the unconscious. At just the right time, McKenna offers, this phenomenon, quote, erupted in a situation of weakened psychic constitution, where there is an element of panic. The UFO as a psychosocial phenomenon came about to confound everything we think we know from science and psychology and sociology. I'll mention four examples of what I think he means. From Einstein's mass energy equivalence in EM E equals MC squared to Schrodinger's E equals HV, a lesser known but equally important equation. We have reeled at Einstein's proof that the rest energy of any massive particle E is equivalent to its mass times the speed of light squared, a very large number. This is known as mass energy equivalence. Mass and energy are interchangeable. Now, Schrodinger's equation says the rest energy of any massive particle E is also equal to H, Planck's constant, a very, very small number, multiplied by the frequency of oscillation V of that particle. This means any stable massive particle behaves as a very precise quantum clock that ticks away with a frequency in exact proportion to its mass. So not only do we have mass energy equivalence from Einstein with Planck's formula, energy and mass also have a direct relationship somehow to the nature of time itself. This is the notion of quantum mechanics for things that are very, very small. We learn of the so-called superposition of particles that tells us everything at the quantum level both do and do not happen. You know, Schrodinger's cat is both alive and dead. It seems reality, from moment to moment it would seem, is just quaffed into existence from a foam of possibilities, all of which happen. Now third, I'll also mention the irreducible complexity of living systems. Everything except life, it would seem, follows the, law of thermo, second, follows the second law of thermodynamics, the tens cord tends toward chaos and disorder. Now you do eat, and yes, you eventually die, but the uh, growth process of life itself doesn't seem to follow the second law of thermodynamics, although there's some reason to believe that it does. Well, anyway, living systems begin complex 
and increase in their complexity as they grow, develop, and evolve over time. Bottom line is McKenna likens the UFO phenomenon as akin to the coming of Christ that overturned the Roman Empire in only 300 years. Modern physics and all these discoveries represent that big of an overhaul. To find out if your experience was real, we'd need to know something about matter itself, the objects we see existing out there that occur in everyday life. To explain ordinary experience, we need to know what's the matter. That is, what is matter? Well, turns out we're not sure. Conscious life, as we know it, is made up of bodies. Bodies are made up of organs and organ systems, and those organs are made up of cells. Those cells are made up of molecules, and those molecules are made up of atoms. And atoms, we know, are made up of mostly empty space. So there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to walk through walls, right? Matter is energy, after all. By the time we get way down to particle physics, we discover we don't know what anything is really made of. All we can talk about are possibilities or potentials. All we can say is what Stephen Hawking says here, quote, even if there is only one possible unified theory of physics, it would just be a set of rules and equations. So he asks, what is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? What I'd like to point out here is the philosopher Galen Strawson's observation that, quote, consciousness is the most familiar thing there is. It is, in fact, the only thing in the universe whose ultimate intrinsic nature we can claim to know. It is utterly mis unmysterious. The nature of physical stuff, by contrast, is deeply mysterious. And physics grows stranger by the hour. I would like to say this statement points to how important and precious your experience is, as the only thing we can claim to know, despite our ability to fabricate and confabulate and forget things, which is what I'm trying to help you avoid in this presentation. Finally, another way to conceptualize the approach I'm talking about is to say this bold and beautiful approach, this approach of wonder and skepticism, does not actually exist as an attitude. Rather, it's sort of a Tao approach, a middle path, and a balancing act that I will call triangulating truth. In this sense, maybe triangulating enthusiasm with... Enthusiasm with being a true believer true believer, with being the incurious, kind of triangulating all those together to find the sweet spot. The sweet spot is one of suspended belief to which one can surrender all your intellectual processing into ultimately going with your gut. It's kind of like making any major decision in your life, like buying a house or getting married. You know, you reason through all the pros and cons ruling out options and ruling in options to consider until you finally just make the call and propose to your spouse. Not out of uninformed blindness, but after careful consideration. I'm saying there's no computer algorithm for life-altering decisions that are really important, such as when you're trying to make sense of the most incredible experience you've had in a close encounter. You know, as Teddy Roosevelt said, do what you can with what you have where you are. I think it's a healthy way to go about life, actually. You can have regrets and change your mind, but remember that you did the best you could with what you knew at the time. Now, for a departure, sort of a part two here. The example of this approach I'd like to spend the rest of my time on is lining up two different approaches on the study of consciousness, you know, that place where your experience happened. I'm going to compare research findings from Michael Graziano, a mainstream evolutionary neuroscientist who has developed a theory of consciousness called Attention Schema Theory, or AST. I'm going to compare that with a single idea 
developed out of the mainstream by religious philosopher Jeffrey Kripal and the even more out of the mainstream author Whitley Strieber in a book called The Supernatural. I'm asking you to take out your bold and beautiful, wonder-filled skepticism and open-minded skeptic option for a test drive here. Hope you're ready. Now here's a comparison of these two ideas. Graziano's attention schema theory attempts to demonstrate consciousness, which you recall as the only thing in the universe whose ultimate intrinsic nature you can claim to know, is actually produced by your brain. Consciousness, your self-awareness and your immediate experience as a conscious agent, is actually the result of a long line of adaptations to survive over about 700 million years in your ancestors. These mechanisms are driven or pushed by survival. I would add to that my impression that Graziano would suggest this means experiences of UFOs and non-human intelligences are more than likely mistaken predators that are a result of what are called false positives that actually happen for good reason. For example, you believe that there's rustling in grass and the rustling in the grass is actually a lion when there isn't actually a lion there. Now there's no harm done by this mistake, but if you fail to detect an actual lion, you'd be dinner. So you're kind of encouraged to get it wrong. Now I'll explain attention schema theory in more detail to do justice to it, but for now, let me compare it to a simple turn of phrase offered by Kripal and Strieber. Instead of the body-brain producing consciousness, what if the body-brain reduces consciousness? What if consciousness is more like a receiver than it is a byproduct? What if we are consciousness, confined and contracted to this body, and only what it can perceive? Now, in this view, your conscious experience is a field of awareness that can occasionally slip outside of its confined awareness because it's not being pushed by survival, but rather pulled toward wider perspectives. This would make such confounding UFO ET experiences not much different than any other mystical or unitive or Gnostic experience beheld by those individuals in history who have attempted and most often failed to translate it into comprehensible terms. I'd like to take you through both of these ideas to see if it might be helpful. Attention schema theory goes like this. Some of the tiniest and least complex organisms like the hydra, which we are told existed 700 million years ago, developed nerves to detect visual signals. It was the competition between these nerve cells that sharpened visual signals. The competition. This interference pattern, called selective signal enhancement, allowed the organism's better perceptual ability. Now then, 520 million years ago, we see a history in the development of life called the central controller, also called tectum, meaning roof. You know, kind of a roof over the lower brain. Well, that allowed your ancestor to aim its eyes, ears, and nose to get a more accurate, accurate picture of the world. This system of interference allowed for simulation and prediction of the environment. Now then, 350 million years ago, in the Wulst cortex, this allowed for covert attention. This means the ability to process not only immediately important stimuli, but also peripheral processing. This allows you to drive your car with your eye on the road while listening to the radio and watching out for the kid on the bicycle. Now this attention schema you developed allowed you to develop what's called theory of mind. Like the one I mentioned about the lion, it allowed you to detect other conscious agents and their possible motivation. Now finally, only 70,000 years ago, the development of language allowed for even more fine attunement to these others. It led to an abounding number of false positives based on the need for survival. You know, so where floods, earthquakes, and eclipses 
Well, they became actions taken by watchers or invented gods. Now, I believe Dr. Graziano would suggest this case of mistaking identities of agents. He'd call that evidence that we're doing that as the modern form of extraterrestrials. He'd probably say that they're a bunch of false positives. Impressions that they're agents out there when there aren't any. Well, you could probably tell by my sarcasm, I'm not impressed by the evidence that the brain produces consciousness because, you know, it kind of falls flat in the face with that last interpretation. It denies your experience of an actual non-human intelligence you know communicated to you in a way that did not seem possible. Now, this attention schema theory takes you down the road of being a true believer and kind of a denier. But... I don't want to dismiss it either, because what I notice in the AST model is what seems to be its basis, what I kept calling interference patterns. Now, at every stage of development, consciousness, I think, can be seen as emerging into greater abilities to hold wider perspectives. Such a view based on interference patterns is consistent, in my view, with the notion of a holographic universe where the brain and body acts more like a, like a virtual simulator. Evolution involves a greater capacity to simulate the environment, yes. But what is this environment out there but mostly empty space, consisting of matter, energy, and possibilities? Understood, I guess, only by a set of rules and equations, quaffing into existence from moment to moment. You know, what exactly is being simulated here? Well, what I'd like to say here is that the physics we are trying to comprehend from discoveries now a hundred years old, you know, quantum and Einstein's relativity theories, a hundred years ago, they also suggest that in this universe there is no other. And what I mean by that is physics reveals this unbroken whole where everything is connected at a deeper level. You and your thoughts represent only a single facet of this undivided whole. To get around in this world being simulated, it's helpful to see reality as consisting of levels or scales from the very small to the very large. Well, this makes your thoughts and experiences very precious and important. It also allows there, there to be others out there with whom you can have contact. And it allows me to safely say there is likely one mind with many faces. Now DMT and psilocybin psychedelic chemicals, they might temporarily loosen the scale or level of reality you're aware of. But this connectedness at a deeper level certainly allows for non-human intelligences communicating telepathically as well as UFO craft, quaffing into and out of existence. Well, this view, I'd like to suggest, is the spirit of ufology. And by that, I mean a way to assimilate the authenticity of your experience with wonder and skepticism, with boldness and beauty, with open-minded skepticism. The context of a cosmos that is undivided at the deepest level. Wow, huh? Now, Carl Sagan, the greatest science educator of our time, I would say, would not likely have entertained this uncomfortable approach to ufology, mostly because science is much too tentative to say what I just said there. But I hope he would have been able to see the fruitfulness of this uncomfortable and orthodox and unorthodox approach to asking better questions. I would hope he would recall his statement, quote, the suppression of uncomfortable ideas may be common in religion and politics, but it's not the path to knowledge. It has no place in the endeavor of science. I would hope he could see this approach as an avenue of exploration that encapsulates his most famous quotation that, quote, some part of our being knows this is where we came from. We long to return, and we can, because the cosmos is also within us. 
We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. Now, before you get too excited and believe me to have fallen off the rails of being a UFO enthusiast, uncritical toward any possibility of UFO ET communication, let me remind you what Carl Sagan also said. Quote, we wish to pursue the truth no matter where it leads. But to find the truth, we need imagination and skepticism both. We will not be afraid to speculate, but we will be careful to distinguish speculation from fact. Now, I'd like to conclude this presentation with kind of a cautionary tale. It begins like this. So again, before you think I've gone off the rails to offer all these quotations as experts who can answer your deepest questions, I've picked these next few from Carl Jung just because they seem to remain in the sweet spot for me. Now, Carl Jung, Sigmund Freud's crown, heir, and prince to psychoanalysis, wrote on the subject of UFOs, calling them, quote, Autonomous fragments of psychic energy temporarily escaped from the controlling power of the ego. He also said, quote, It boils down to this, that either psychic projections throw back a radar echo, or else the appearance of real objects affords an opportunity for mythological projections. Now here I must remark that even if the UFOs are physically real, the corresponding psychic projections are not actually caused, but are only occasioned by them. And consider this as well in the context of what I have offered here. On the subject of possession or demonism, Carl Jung calls these primordial psychic phenomena a, quote, peculiar state of mind characterized by the fact that certain psychic contexts, contents the so-called complexes, take over the role of the total personality in place of the ego, or at least temporarily, to such a degree that the free will of the ego is suspended. Now, what does this say about our approach that strives to use imagination and skepticism both to discover the truth of our experiences? Your free will seems to be suspended. Sounds a lot like an encounter. Well, I will close by offering a list of things to avoid. Ways to sort of curb your enthusiasm of your imagination, should you need it. Now, these are known as characteristics associated with what is called by Robert Augustus Masters, spiritual bypassing. This is the shadow side of spirituality that often comes with a newly opened mind, I said curiosity has demanded. Now, in your appreciation and awe of the sublime experience of unity and oneness of this universal mind, you might find yourself losing the value of being one of the incurious. And as some insights into this idea that everything is connected at a deeper level and the brain reduces this universal mind in your body, as those ideas start to take hold, uh, you might find yourself becoming emotionally detached from this world, emotionally numb, overemphasizing the positive, having a fear of anger, or being oddly blind or overtly tolerant and compassionate to your brothers and sisters, who are all of your same mind. You might notice you have too weak or too porous boundaries, losing your sense of self altogether. You might notice you have become debilitated in your ability to judge your own negativity. This might lead to devaluation of your personal relationships relative to your spiritual awakening, or worse yet, having delusions of having arrived at some higher level of being or awareness. Now, just to let you know, I have personally been there and done that with at least a few of these, so I speak from experience. But my hope in this presentation has been to allow permission to explore our greatest heights while being reminded of the worst of our habits. Now again, I'd hate to speak as an authority, but my personal exploration into this confounding subject 
has shown me that to tell the difference between true wholeness, of which this cosmos seems to consist, and my attempts at discovering what seems in my gut to be true, I have found the following helpful in my research. You know, if I develop a hypothesis, I try to falsify it. I dig deep to discover where I might have gone off track. My search, as I said, is fueled by wonder and skepticism both. These are my guides, and they're all I have, namely my reason and emotion. That's what I'm equipped with. I seek out ideas with the goal to upend my notions of what I think I know to be true. There's nothing more dangerous than somebody who's convinced that they know the truth. And finally, if I am but a way for the cosmos to know itself, I try to remember this narrow bandwidth I inhabit. And since I can't find any better words to close, that capture the sense in which I experience the fuel of my wonder and skepticism, I'm reminded of one last Carl Sagan quotation, and I put it in the first person. My feeblest contemplations of the cosmos stir me. There is a tingling in my spine, a catch in my voice, a faint sensation as if a distant memory of falling from a height. I know I am approaching the greatest of mysteries. Now, if you've had one of these extraordinary encounters, I wish you the best in your discovery to learn the truth. And I hope I haven't made it any worse. Thank you for your kind attention. If you're interested in some of the ideas that our group takes seriously, please pay a visit to any of these offerings. Spooky Action at a Distance TV is in production on public access, but we'll try to make it available on YouTube. Check out Dave Paris's Space Warp Dynamics and Space Warp Dynamics LLC. And as always, the Omaha UFO Study Group.com is where we post these videos and other new ideas that we try to publish annually in a symposium. Thank you again for your attention. Bye bye for now.